Now I'm going to dispel some myths surrounding build quality and sound quality. As I said earlier, you will tend to find that units are either large and complex or small and simple. And so when you're paying more for a bigger unit, you're mostly paying for the extra bells and whistles. It's not necessarily going to be the case that the larger unit sounds better. The things that affect sound quality are the quality of the cassette itself, the tape speed, and how well calibrated the unit has been. So if you have a huge unit like a 644 and a small four track unit like a 414, provided they're both equally well calibrated and you put the same kind of cassette in both units, then the differences in an AB blind test should be like really difficult to discern. You should be very close in fidelity between both units. The difference is that the 414 would be very portable to carry around and the 644 does all sorts of extra things like MIDI synchronization and it has a much larger mixer and this kind of thing. In my opinion, when people talk about, oh, such and such a unit sounds better than such and such a unit, I suspect that the difference in perception comes down to one of those units was badly calibrated and the other was well calibrated. If you're a guitarist, you can think about this in terms of, say, you've got two basically equivalent Stratocaster type guitars and one of them's like been really well set up with fresh strings and the other one's got ancient strings the action's really high the intonation's off and it hasn't been that well tuned obviously that latter guitar is going to feel and sound worse even though the guitars are basically the same the takeaway i'm trying to give you here is don't get too hung up on oh right tascam sound better than Vostex or or anything like that they sound pretty similar as long as the tape speed is the same so you can go for it in terms of like what's available what's a, at a good price what's been well maintained what has the feature set that suits your needs. And I would say a similar thing about build quality. I find that build quality is much of a muchness across models and across brands. They've all got about the same sort of grade of printed circuit board inside, about the same thickness of plastic. They're all through hole components for the most part. Um, you will find the very budget models have like you know shallower heads and obviously they can have like slower motors, um, but that comes down to the tape speed thing I was talking about earlier. But I do occasionally hear people saying, oh, such and such is a badly made unit and this is a much better made unit. And most of the time, speaking as somebody who has like repaired and recorded with both the units that are being discussed, I'm like, what? To me, they are as well built. Like one of the things that comes up quite often is the claim that, you know, Tascam 244s and 246s are built like tanks because they have an internal metal chassis. And the thing is, that internal metal chassis makes them a lot heavier. And the outer surface is still the same moulded, whatever it is, ABS plastic as you get on later models like, say, a 424 Mark III. And so the 244 will often break under its own weight. You know, if it's dropped or something, all that extra metal will cause the plastic to shatter. So don't let claims about build quality put you off buying something if it's at a good price and it looks like it's well maintained and it's going to fit your musical purpose. I think sometimes when people are making these claims about build quality they've been stung with a unit that was badly maintained or badly stored by a previous owner and uh, we're always going to be rolling a dice when we buy one of these things because they are what 25 years old coming on 40 years old we don't really know how they've been stored often when we buy them. Um, so it's hard to make kind of generalizations about the experience you're going to have in terms of how hard to repair a particular unit is going to be. You know, and sometimes I'll get a unit and uh, it was very easy to repair and then I'll get the same model in and it, was, it turns out to be difficult to repair. And I just put that down to differences in storage or the way that it's been handled by previous owners and that is difficult to quantify, unfortunately. So I suppose that's a good way to seg into expectations about maintenance. These things are no longer supported by their manufacturer, so the likelihood that at some point you're going to need to do some sort of repair or maintenance is quite high. It's not definite, but it's likely. So either need to have a budget for and access to somebody who knows how to fix it, or you need to learn to do it yourself which is exactly where my channel comes in. I mean, I do some creative stuff as well, but a lot of my content is focused on trying to empower people to be able to kind of fix this stuff themselves. It's not rocket science. It can be fun. It can be a good gateway into broader electronic skills. It does require some patience, 
it does require a small investment in tools. It can be time consuming and nerve wracking, especially to begin with. So generally speaking, unless somebody's already got some electronic skills, I would say that it's a good idea to go for as new and simple a unit as you can justify against your musical needs. I mean, if, if God help you, if you need a 688, well, just buy one, I guess. But I mean, that would be very difficult to repair if something went wrong. Whereas if you could get by with making your record on a, let's say, a Task M414, which is quite small and simple, that would be a lot more manageable if something went wrong with it. In terms of where to buy and how much to pay, unfortunately, it's not like we can just walk into a branch of a major music retailer and buy a particular MCR at a particular price. The these things are long obsolete and so they exist in quite a volatile second-hand market. Prices have been extremely cheap in the past. What you would pay for one now is still a small fraction of what they originally cost when you adjust for inflation, but it can seem quite expensive when you consider what you could get as a digital item with a manufacturer's warranty. Uh, you can get some sense of prices by putting in a particular model into eBay and then checking the completed listings radio box box that's off to the left well that's how it looks like in my interface when I'm on a desktop computer in the UK but that'll give you an idea of how much they're trading for if you're a resident of an urban area then there might be cheaper options available to you like I don't know thrift stores estate clearance auctions recycling centers and another good thing about searching for these items in these places is then that you might actually have an opportunity to inspect or even try the item before you buy it. I'm going to close out the video by giving you some sort of idea of the least that you should expect from a seller if you're going to buy one of these, especially if you're buying from eBay or Reverb or some other kind of mail order outlet. Unless you're buying something where they've specifically said, I don't really know what this is, I can't vouch for it, and they've dropped the price correspondingly, I would want some sort of assurance that all the functions have been tested. I've seen listings where people are claiming, oh, the unit's fully working, it just needs belts. And the thing about a claim like that is, if the belts are gone, that means they can't use the cassette player. And if they can't use the cassette player, then really the only thing they can test is putting a signal through the mixer. You know, the cassette player has to be working in order to check that the record and playback amplifier are working. So really that kind of thing should be sold as seen or spares or repairs. If a unit's being listed as serviced, I think it's reasonable to ask for a list of the procedures that have been carried out. You know, some people will give it a clean and change the rubber. Some people will furthermore calibrate it. Some people will go beyond that and they'll change capacitors and the power supply unit and all sorts of things. So it's worth knowing whether you're getting like a very basic service or the deluxe service or the super duper deluxe service. I also think it's fair to ask for some indication of how much experience the person doing the service has. The reality is you don't need to be like an electrical engineer in order to refurbish these things. I'm not an electrical engineer and I have refurbished them and I have sold units as serviced before. But it's important to distinguish between someone like me who's done a lot of that and somebody who's like changed belts once before. Also, while a musician would probably know how to test everything on an MCR. If the person selling the unit is the previous owner's you know, widow or child, you know, I've bought from people under those sorts of circumstances before. With the best of intentions, they may not actually know how to test all the features of the unit. So be aware of who you're buying from in that way. If you are paying more than the average amount as per you know eBay completed listings for a serviced unit, I would look for some sort of uh, guarantee above and beyond the basic statutory rights or buyer protection that's being offered by the selling platform. What I mean is if someone said, I have changed all the rubber in this, you want some sort of assurance that if three months down the line, one of the belt snaps, that they're going to provide you with that part. I hope this was helpful. If there's anything else that you're not clear on, get at me in the comments. Thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.